Welcome everyone to Copyright in Online Teaching and Learning, a webinar brought to you by the Academy for Teaching Excellence at Harper College. My name is Melissa Basinger and I'm an Instructional Design Specialist in the Academy. This webinar today is being run in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is a new tool now available in the course tools area of every Blackboard course shell at Harper. You can reach out to the Academy for Teaching Excellence uh, to learn more about using Collaborate Ultra in your classes. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our presenter for this webinar, Dr. Jessica Raymond. Jessica is an Associate Professor of English at Northern Illinois University and is also the Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of English. She's an advocate for informed and responsible use of copyrighted materials in teaching and research, especially in new digital contexts. She's the author of the book, Toward a Rhetoric of Intellectual Property, Copyright Law, and the Regulation of Digital Culture, and has presented and been published in many scholarly journals on issues related to copyright in higher education. Jessica is also currently serving as chair of the Intellectual Property Caucus for the Conference on College Composition and Communication, which is a branch of the National Council for Teachers of English. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm excited to be here to talk with you all about copyright in online teaching and learning. A lot of educators worry about copyright issues that arise in the course of teaching, showing films, sharing ratings, and a host of other issues. Many other instructors have not thought much about these issues, believing that if it's for educational use, there's no need to concern themselves about copyright. My hope is that the information I share with you today will calm your concerns about copyright and also raise awareness for those who are coming to the issues for the first time. I'll begin with this broad question that's bringing us together today. What materials can I use lawfully and ethically in my online teaching and learning? To answer this question, we'll move through a discussion that has two parts. Part one answers questions about how you can lawfully and responsibly share course materials, and in particular, text-based materials such as class readings with your students online. Part two focuses on the use of audiovisual works, such as images, video, and audio materials in online teaching. So let's start with part one, sharing course readings. There are three ways that you can share course materials, including class readings, such as articles, text-based resources, and textbook chapters, linking, fair use, and obtaining permissions from the copyright holder. The easiest option for sharing course materials with your students online is not to make any copies at all. Copyright issues with course materials usually arise because you're making copies. So make life easy on yourself and your students by not making copies. So how can you share them without making copies? If the readings are publicly available online, link to them or even just share the URL or website address. If readings and other materials are published online, such as through a news organization without a paywall, you can feel free to link to them. Today, there are many online resources that have been released for open access upon publication. These resources are available freely online. Some scholarly repositories, such as PubMed Central for science articles and SSRN for social science research, present high quality, peer-reviewed articles in full text form that you can easily link to. While linking is an easy option for sharing copyrighted works online with your students, keep in mind that even if a work is publicly available, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's being shared legally. So you will want to be sure that these works that you're linking to are being shared lawfully under copyright law. Things get a little more complicated when you would like to share a journal article or other materials that you get uh, through your university library. If you access a journal article through the online databases via your library's website, you should plan to link to the article through the library database rather than downloading it as a PDF and distributing it to your students. These articles are presented through subscription services such as EBSCO 
or ProQuest and are not freely available to the public. Contractual agreements between libraries and subscription services often require that faculty and students download copies for personal use only. This means that when sharing readings with students, that instructors direct them to access the articles directly through the database via a link rather than sharing PDFs. Therefore, if the readings are available online via a university library subscription, link to them. This way, your students can access them by logging into the library databases themselves. Most university libraries provide assistance with linking to articles shared in databases or can provide you with other options for sharing these materials, such as uh, using library course reserves. If you would like to share copies of works rather than linking to them, you should consider fair use. Fair use is an important provision in copyright law that allows some copying without permission or payment. It is sometimes legal to, to make fair use copies of materials for students in your online classes. The text of the fair use statute explicitly allows sharing copyrighted works, quote, for the purposes, for purposes such as teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research, unquote. Instructors in university settings are trusted to make their own reasonable and informed choices about fair use. But there are no easy rules for fair use. If you want to take advantage of fair use, you have to understand its complexities. To understand fair use, you need to be familiar with the four statutory factors. You have to consider each use of each copyrighted work on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at the details in context. Even then, fair use can be unpredictable, enough so that the best anyone can do is make a well-informed, reasonable decision. There are no bright line yes or no answers. When deciding whether your use of class readings is a fair use, you will need to conduct a four-factor fair use analysis. You will need to consider all four factors and weigh the benefits against the negative effects of your potential use. The four factors are as follows. First, the purpose and character of the use. Purposes that favor fair use include education, scholarship, research, and news reporting, as well as criticism and commentary more generally. Nonprofit purposes also favor fair use. Commercial or for-profit purposes weigh against fair use. The second factor is the nature of the original work. One element of this factor is whether the work is published or not. It is less likely to be fair use to use elements of an unpublished work, which makes sense. Basically, making someone else's work public when they choose not to is not very fair. Another element of this factor is whether the work is more factual or more creative. Borrowing from a factual work is more likely to be fair than borrowing from a highly creative work. The third factor in a fair use analysis is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. A use is usually more in favor of fair use if it uses a smaller amount of the source work and usually more likely to weigh against fair use if it uses a larger amount. But the amount is proportional. So a quote of 250 words from a 300 word poem might be less fair than a quote of 250 words from a many thousand word article. The final and fourth factor is the effect of the use on the potential market, market for or the value of the source work. This factor is truly challenging. It asks users to become amateur economists, analyzing existing and potential future markets for a work and predicting the effect a proposed use will have on those markets. But the simple question for you to ask is, is the use in question substituting for a sale the copyright owner would otherwise make? It can be difficult to apply basic ideas about fair use to specific situations. One good way for you to develop your general understanding of fair use is to use one of the many fair use checklists available to help you think through your decision. On the left here is a checklist made available on Harper College's website. I encourage you to use it, uh, explore it today, and to use it uh, in the future when you're making fair use decisions.
Sometimes there is no way to get students to a reading without making copies and when fair use doesn't seem to apply to the copying. Then you may need to seek permission to make the copies. Seeking permissions from the copyright owner, usually the publisher of a particular journal or book, means paying royalties for use. There is usually a fee involved for the students. Now let's test your knowledge on part one. This part is interactive. I'll ask you to select one of the following options in response to this scenario. A faculty member would like his students to read an article from an academic journal. He downloads the journal article from the library database and posts it to his class Blackboard site. Is this use permissible? Select one if your answer is no, he would need to pay royalties to use the article. Two for no, he would need to link to the article through the library database. Three for yes, this is a fair use of the article because it's for educational purposes. And four, yes, he can distribute it to students because the site is password protected. So take your best guess, select uh, one through four on whether you think this use is permissible. In this case, you did very well. In this case, the answer is two. No, he would need to link through the data database. Remember those contractual agreements between university libraries and subscription databases? Many of those agreements preclude downloading and sharing and require that faculty direct students back to the database through a URL. Let's try again with a new scenario. Scenario two, choose the best answer. A faculty member shares copies of several poems from a book of poetry by a contemporary writer with her students through Blackboard. The students will read and analyze the poems and write a paper based on them. Is this use permissible? One, yes, this is a fair use because the students are using the poems for the purposes of criticism. Two, yes, this is a fair use because she's using only three poems from a book of 25. Three, yes, this is a fair use because the student's use of the poems does not impose any limitations on the market for the author's poetry. Four, no, this is not a fair use because the poems are creative works. This one is somewhat of a trick question because it's asking you to walk through a four-factor fair use analysis. Each item, one through four, asks you to consider each of the four factors of fair use. In this case, it is likely that the use would satisfy three out of the four factors. The proposed use is for the purposes of critique. The students will do more than read poems for enjoyment. They will add to knowledge about poetry by offering new and insightful analyses of the poems. Second, the student's use of three poems will not affect the market value as the poems are available online for reading with no purchase necessary. In terms of amount, while the students are reading only three poems out of 25 in the collection, it's possible that this factor could count against fair use in that each poem constitutes a whole. But the one factor that clearly counts against fair use is the nature of the work. Poems are highly creative rather than factual. Given this four-factor analysis and weighing all four factors together, we can see that the factors weigh pretty strongly in favor of fair use more than against, and this use would likely be permissible. Now that we've addressed ways to share text-based resources online with our students, let's move to the more complicated topic of sharing multimedia works, such as images, videos, and music. Most of the time, showing things to students in class is okay. There is a specific provision in copyright law, section 110, called the classroom use exemption that allows instructors to display copyrightable materials for students without limitation, payment, or permission in the face-to-face -face classroom setting. The classroom use exemption is pretty narrow but it does enable you to share materials such as books, maps, illustrations, videos, music, in hard copy or on screen within the classroom. But 
online and distance education classes are not covered by the classroom use exemption. It only applies when students and teachers are physically present in the same space. We all know that using video and music and images are central to teaching in digital environments in contemporary educational settings. So how do you share audiovisual works with your students in a distance learning environment? The TEACH Act, or Technology, Education, and Copyright Harmonization Act of, of 2002, allows educators to perform or display copyrighted works in distance education environments. If you would like to show a video or display an image during your online class, you may want to consider whether that use is allowable under the TEACH Act. Implementing the TEACH Act can be difficult because of its complexity and the many detailed requirements for instructor, instructors, technologists, and institutions. But there are many benefits to the TEACH Act. The TEACH Act explicitly allows the following activities. Performances and displays of nearly all types of copyrighted works. The transmission of digital materials to students at distance education locations. Storage of copyrighted content for brief periods of time, such as that which occurs in the process of transmitting digital content, and creating digital versions of, of print or analog works. In order to take advantage of these benefits, instructors and institutions must meet certain policy requirements specified by the, by the TEACH Act. Reasonable measures to assure that only enrolled students will have access to the materials during the course of instruction must be in place before TEACH exemptions can be made. So here is a list of a few of the requirements of the TEACH Act. Use of materials must be within the context of mediated instructional activities, analogous to that of a face-to-face -face class session. Reasonable efforts must be made to prevent students from distributing the material after viewing it. Students must be informed that the materials they access are protected by copyright. And educational institutions must have a policy on the use of copyrighted materials and provide informative resources for faculty advising them on their rights. This is only a limited list of the many requirements of the TEACH Act. In order to take advantage of the provisions allowed through the TEACH Act, uh, here are some concrete uh, suggestions about how to implement it. When displaying audiovisual works, you should remember to limit uses to performances and displays of works. The TEACH Act does not apply to materials that are for students' independent use and retention later. You should limit sharing to mediated instructional activities which in most cases means limiting the time that materials are shared to what would be like a face-to-face -face class meeting. You should password protect any materials shared so that only students in your class have access to them. You should take reasonable measures to prevent downloading and further distribution of the materials. And finally, you should post a copyright notice for your students attached to each copyrighted work that you share. Additionally, in order to take advantage of the TEACH Act, your college or university must also take steps to meet requirements. The two most important requirements for your institution are one, develop a campus-wide policy on using copyrighted works in online teaching, and two, inform faculty of their rights and responsibilities when using copyrighted works in their online teaching. The requirements for complying with the TEACH Act are numerous. They can be difficult to meet. As opportunities for applying the TEACH Act are limited in scope, keep in mind that you may also consider linking to works or applying to fair use when using copyrighted works online and in distance education settings. Beyond the TEACH Act, the use of audio and visual works in online instruction may be allowed, but you have to think about it through the lens of fair use and the four-factor test. Fair use is still the most flexible and far-reaching exemption for educators to apply in online teaching and learning. As we discussed earlier, educational copying is more likely to be a fair use when it uses a smaller portion of the original work, when the portion used is key to the pedagogical purpose, 
when it causes little harm to the financial interests of publishers, and so on. Such copying is less likely to be fair use when it uses large portions of the original work, when it has only tangential relationships to pedagogical purposes, or when it directly harms the copyright holder's finances. Sharing a short excerpt of a popular song with students for the purposes of criticism and critique is likely to be fair use, while distributing copies of the entire album for download is not. Fair use, when applied to audiovisual works, relies on your ability to conduct a well-informed case-by-case four-factor analysis, the same that you do for your um, sharing your text-based resources. Now let's test your knowledge of applying copyright to the use of audiovisual works in online teaching and learning. Please select the best answer for the following scenario. An instructor owns a DVD of a documentary. She wants to share an excerpt with her online class for the purposes of analysis and critique. The students will view the video asynchronously on their own time. Is this use permissible? One, yes because it's fair use. Two, yes, because the classroom use exemption applies. Or three, yes, because the TEACH Act allows it. In this case, the answer is yes, because it's a fair use, number one. The classroom use exemption, remember, does not apply because the use is in the context of online teaching rather than a face-to-face -face classroom. Three is incorrect as well, as the TEACH Act does not allow this type of use. Asynchronous, independent viewing and retention of the file by downloading a copy of the video. In this case, however, because it's for the purposes of critique, shares only an excerpt from the whole DVD, is derived from a factual rather than creative work, and poses no market risk, this, is, this use is very likely a fair use. A fair use analysis in this case weighs strongly in favor of fair use. Let's try again with scenario four. An instructor would like to create a PowerPoint presentation containing photographs from an artist and share it with her online class. The instructor has accessed the images from the artist's own website, downloaded them, and copied them into the PowerPoint. The students will download the PowerPoint file to study on their own time. Is this permissible? Yes, because the TEACH Act allows sharing copyrighted materials with distance ed students. Yes, because the images are easily accessible online. Or no, because the TEACH Act requires additional restrictions. Okay, good. The answer is three. No, because the TEACH Act requires additional restrictions. In this case, even though the images are accessible online, the instructor has chosen to make copies and distribute them rather than linking to them. In order to use the images in this way under the TEACH Act, she would need to impose some restrictions on the use. Such restrictions would include preventing downloads of the images, including a copyright notice, and displaying the images for a brief period of time only. Access, of course, would need to be limited to students in her class only. So how did you do on these two scenarios? I hope you can see that copyright decisions are complex and depend on a range of contextual fact factors. Each decision is made on a case-by-case -case basis and there are no bright line rules for use. The best approach is to increase your own awareness of copyright provisions, such as Fair Use and the TEACH Act, so you can apply them when possible and explore other options when needed. In summary, copyright laws have a lot of provisions that are intended to enable use in education, teaching, research, and scholarship. So the good news is that some instructional uses are 100% pre-approved and allowable by law. Here are a couple of things you can do to use copyrighted materials in your teaching where copyright questions are easily resolved. Sharing a link with students via email or within a course website to publicly available resources doesn't involve any of the rights covered by copyright. That is, you're not making and distributing copies, so it poses no issues. The classroom exemption, classroom use exemption, does not apply to online teaching, but the TEACH Act allows performances and displays of copyrighted works in distance education that are analogous to face-to-face -face teaching. 
streaming video and sharing works for limited times and with appropriate regulations against downloading and further distribution is support, supported by the TEACH Act. Finally, remember to apply the most important exception, fair use, frequently and widely. The fair use exception was designed exactly for your purposes, educational uses. And even though the four factors can be confusing, it's in your best interest and it's a good investment of your time to learn them. While a few types of teaching uses are clearly permitted, many others are less clear. Many courses rely on articles and book excerpts, image viewing, listening to music or other audio, or watching video content for independent viewing by students and student retention of copies later for their own per personal use outside of class meetings. In-class viewing is rarely a problem, but sharing materials for students to keep and study later raises questions. A fair use analysis must be applied in each instance to determine whether such sharing of materials with students is lawful. Another wrinkle is that in order to apply exceptions such as the TEACH Act to online teaching, many regulations for both instructors and their home institutions must be met. In conclusion, copyright is a complex topic that governs much of what we do as educators. I hope that this presentation has answered some of your questions and calmed some of your concerns about copyright. I also hope that it's raised new questions as you seek to gain a more nuanced understanding of how copyright law applies to your work. I'll share here some resources that your library staff has put together for more information on copyright. I encourage you to explore the site to learn more. Thank you so much, Jessica, for all of that wonderful information. At this time, we can open it up to any questions from our participants today. I have a question for, um, from Amanda Nielsen in our academy. Do you have any suggestions for the best way to share this information with faculty across campus or colleagues? Uh, yes, I would just say, um, remind you that uh, this session will be, is being recorded and will be available for viewing later. So um, this is a first step to learning more about your rights and, and responsibilities under, under copyright law. Because it's such a um, complex, uh, issue, however, um, I also would direct you to that, um, the great resources that the Harper Library staff put together um, on that page, and to talk to your uh, librarians on campus. Um, something I've learned over the years is librarians are the um, greatest uh, sources of knowledge for copyright information and also the greatest advocates for um, using copyrighted materials in teaching and learning. So if there is a way to uh, share materials, um, they'll find it and, um, and make sure that you're doing so lawfully and, and responsibly. So uh, making those connections with your library staff, I think is a, a great idea too. Awesome, thank you so much, Jessica. I have another question coming in from Kim Fournier uh, in the library. Uh, she said, a teacher asked me yesterday if he could share one chapter from an earlier edition of a textbook because the latest edition does not have said chapter. I'm curious if your answer would be similar to mine. And Kim Fournier is, um, provides a wealth of copyright <laughs> knowledge on campus. So um, thank you for the great question, Kim. Uh, so my answer uh, regarding sharing a chapter from a textbook um, might depend on some of the other contextual factors. Um, I think, uh, generally speaking, if I were to do a fair use analysis in this case, um, it would my answer would probably be that yes, it is is permissible. It's one chapter from a, a larger collection, um, and it's uh, and also it's 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 not affecting the market value because that uh, particular chapter, as you say, is no longer uh, available in the newer edition. So those two factors, I think, weigh quite heavily in the favor of fair use. The only uh, hesitation I have is that it is a textbook um, that he is, uh, he or she is looking to share copies of a portion of a textbook and textbooks are um, primarily marketed for uh, students. So, um, so sometimes uh, textbook chapters uh, are 
it, it's a good idea to um, seek permissions and pay royalties for the use of textbook chapters. Um, so that is one factor. The, the nature of the work, I guess, is one factor that would weigh against fair use. But um, without knowing all the details, I would say that I, I would probably say that this is a permissible use. I'm curious what your answer was, Kim. Kind of piggybacking on Amanda's questions about disseminating the information, um, you do a lot of uh, great work at Northern Illinois. Um, is there any best practice that Northern is doing as far as copyright education that you really like or something that you would recommend or? Again, I would uh, point to our library staff. Um, one. Uh, who, who uh, on our campus too are um, a great resource for information about copyright. And I think one of the most important things when uh, discussing copyright on campus is to really um, resist taking a punitive approach. Um, this really isn't about avoiding um, getting sued. Uh, really what this is is, is um, balancing uh, the needs of creators and users of materials. So. Um, academics, teachers, and scholars inhabit both roles. Uh, we create uh, copyrightable works, uh, we create course materials, we create um, scholarship, and all of that, of course, is, is copyrighted. Our students create new works that, that are copyrighted. At the same time, when creating those works, we rely on a lot of copyrighted works, so we need to access journal articles and, and our students need to access copyrighted materials. And so because we're in that unique position where we inhabit both roles as creators and users, um, you know, we want to recognize that copyright is designed to facilitate all of that activity and balance the needs of users and the needs of creators. And um, I think our library on campus and other um, people who educate the campus community about copyright, um, that's one message that, that they make very clear. This is not a punitive uh, approach to the topic, but rather facilitating innovation. Wonderful, I think that's a great perspective. Um, and Kim just put a comment, um, in the college archives, we have scrapbooks of newspaper articles clipped and glued into books in chronological order starting in 1965. We are in the process of restoring these books. Um, but I'm wondering your opinion about digitizing the preserved paper works and sharing them online. Well, uh, certainly you have the right, uh, this is protected under, under copyright law, you have the right to create digital um, archives to preserve the works. Uh, so the question here is really about distribution. So creating your own digital archive um, that uh, people might access the same way that they do the paper materials is perfectly fine. Uh, but there are some questions that would arise in, um, in distributing them. Uh, they're not quite in the public domain yet. Uh, and so, um, so those materials if you were to distribute them more widely, would likely require um, permission from uh, the copyright owner uh, when possible, or that you place some restrictions on uh, distribution. For instance, only making them available to uh, patrons of your services rather than the public. We have another uh, good question from Kim. A faculty member is developing a testing tutorial for reading comprehension. They are grabbing reading samples from the web. Is that okay? I'm wondering if uh, there's any uh, payment involved um, in this interaction. So uh, is the reading test part of a class session? Um, or a course, a university course, or is it part of a standardized test for which there's uh, some sort of payment involved? Kim responded, the test is free, and yes, it is part of um, an ESL class at Harper. Okay, in that case, I, I don't think that this poses any issue. This does seem um, like fair use. They're using excerpts from the larger reading, the um, purpose is educational, and there's no competition for the market. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be clearly a fair use. We have um, a question from Mary. Can I use a chapter out of a nonfiction book 
for a project in class. Students would only use one chapter, about 20 pages, of a 200-page book. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, I think uh, using a chapter out of a longer book, um, you know, the answer to that question depends on uh, what you mean by or, or how you might be distributing it and sharing it with your students. So uh, if this were um, a face-to-face -face class and you were making copies, uh, that would be uh, permissible. If this were online and you're planning to share it as a, a PDF, for instance, on Blackboard, um, and it were password protected and only your students had access to it, I think that that would be permissible as well. So um, just, you know, making sure that you're not simply posting it on an open and publicly available website would be key, but as long as you're using a course management system and distributing it only to your students, since it's a small uh, piece of a larger work, um, I think that would be perfectly fine. Um, you know, there are a lot of guidelines that you can access online for classroom use and how fair use applies. And those guidelines get pretty specific uh, saying, oh, you can use, you know, you might have seen these where you can use 10% uh, of a work, which is exactly what you're asking to use is 10% of this work. Um, and those guidelines are a little misleading uh, because we can't base a fair, fair use analysis on one factor, of course. So you mentioned that it's a short work, um, 10% an e short excerpt, which is 10% of the work. And I would just encourage you as you're thinking through the, the, the decisions to also think about the other three factors. Um, it is nonfiction, as you note, so that um, weighs in favor of fair use. Uh, it's a short excerpt, which weighs in favor of fair use. It's um, for educational uh, use, which weighs in favor of fair use. Um, and there's no market competition, so that also weighs in favor of fair use. So I think you're in the clear. Good question, Mary. So I want to um, extend a very sincere thank you to Jessica uh, for being with us today for our inaugural webinar from the Academy for Teaching Excellence. I think there was a lot of great information and just a fantastic job um, providing a nice, clear layout for how we can have some tools to proceed ourselves with uh, providing materials to our students. Uh, just a reminder, we have been recording this session and we will make a session recording available to everyone. We'll send it directly via email to everyone who registered um, and we'll also put it on the Academy website for access. So that should be in about a week. Um, just a reminder about those, that great website, um, that uh, Kim Fournier, who is on the session today, had a big hand in putting together at the library. Um, the Fair Use Checklist is out there, as well as a ton of other great resources related to copyright. So um, a big hand to Kim, and thank you to our library for all that they can provide us. Um, as Jessica mentioned, the library is a fantastic resource and a great place to go when we're trying to get materials and use them. Um, at this point, I would like to thank everyone for attending. There were a lot of thank yous, Jessica, coming through the chat room. So um, thank you all for participating today. And uh, I hope we will see you at more webinars in the future. And just a reminder, we've been running in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is available under the course tools area of every Blackboard shell in Harper now. So you are all um, able to explore this tool, and you can contact the Academy for Teaching Excellence for more information or training on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Thank you so much again, Jessica, for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for attending, and good luck with your copyright decisions. All right, thank you. Have a very nice day, everyone.